I have two questions and I think you can, uh, you can answer whichever one you prefer. Um, one is really about how you imagine a future where food is not a commodity and people are actually, people who produce food are actually able to eat enough food and so that they live a decent life. And how do you envision that, that kind of food production? And the other one is, you know, the World Bank or the UN, we're always hearing how uh, over time, the world's population has been improving and doing better and better. And where do they, where does this come from? And now they're saying, oh no, COVID-19 is throwing us back and uh, this is no longer ruining all this forward progress that has been made. What are they talking about? Thank you. What a great, th I can answer both of those. In fact, I need to answer both of those. Let me start the, the last one first. Um, we've been hearing about how we've never had it so good. Uh, it's been very interesting over the past four or five years to see even, you know, you, to, to some extent, you can get to this conclusion if you mess with the data. Uh, and so that's why I mentioned that the definition of malnutrition was a political football, because uh, if you change what it is to be malnourished, you can reduce that number. Um, but they've stretched that as far as anyone can reasonably take it. So to be malnourished now is to be uh, deprived of calories systematically and, and over the course of a year in, in a sort of mon you know, in a way that uh, you never you never escape that situation. So it's not just a seasonal famine; it's like permanent permanent uh, deprivation of calories. Um, and with that definition, even with that definition, the number of people who have been hungry and the proportion of people who are hungry has been going up. Uh, and so over the past three years, um, that's been a, a, a feature. And in general, they've blamed this, uh, you know, the World Bank and, and World Food Program, what have you, have blamed it on conflict. Uh, they, they, they said, well, you know, people are fighting each other, aren't they naughty? Um, and then they started to say a little bit about climate. Uh, and now it's clear that, that, in fact, the big C is capitalism. Uh, and that's, that's how uh, I, I want to get into the idea of what it might be to decommodify food, which is your first question. What, what, what would it be like after the revolution? Um, it's been very interesting to see uh, glimpses of that through things like um, the school system. Uh, in New York City, for example, the school system has stepped up to provide meals initially just for all kids, um, but now it's three meals a day for anyone who wants it. Um, now, unfortunately, the kinds of meals are the sorts of things that are uh, you know, essentially going to poison the working class. I mean, it, it's all sort of processed food. Uh, but there are a number of organizations that have ideas about what it would look like for workers to own the land or to control the land rather, not, I mean, to, to, to work it cooperatively, to work the supply chain cooperatively and work you know, popular restaurants and to eat collectively. Um, and oddly, they, these are workers who are at the moment in one of the most exploitative parts of the US food system, the meat industry. Um, but th there are some really good ideas about worker-owned, worker-run cooperatives uh, that go from farm to fork. Uh, and that do have things like popular restaurants. Um, so uh, state-run enterprises, in, in particularly in Latin America, uh, are uh, ways that the state has taken it upon itself to make sure that everyone can have food whenever they want it. Um, and to stitch together both a land reform story, which is a desperately important part of how it is that we get to a better world and after, you know, where we, we absolutely need revolutionary change, and a, a story about uh, you know, popular restaurants where food is available and made available by municipalities to anyone who wants it. That arc um, is one that we have the pieces of. And whether it's, you know, the rural landless workers movement in Brazil occupying land and then you know, going through the food system to provide that food agroecologically, uh, or whether it's about these popular restaurants, uh, they're, they're, they are, there are people thinking this through. Uh, and thinking about the systemic change we need to move from climate, uh, you know, from a climate catastrophe produced by capitalism to a world that is driven by uh, the agendas of working people. Hey, Raj, thank you for the talk. Um, my question is, I'm wondering if you can just sort of walk us through a little more the, um, this problem of the farms overproducing, not being able to sell their food, so they're destroying crops. We're seeing that in the US, we're seeing it, I've read about reports of it internationally. And more specifically, the, the, the part I'm curious about is they cite for their own reasons that a huge 
uh, market they lost is um, hotels and restaurants. Um, and so, but when I was thinking, you know, when you think about it, it's not that, yes, absolutely, some people go eat their food at restaurants and hotels, but that, I don't know if that's where most of the uh, poor and the working class are getting their food. So my question is, how does the food shortage and crop destruction sort of trickle down into those there being shortages for people who aren't getting it from who wouldn't have gotten it from the restaurants and the and the hotels in the first place how does the shortage in one area sort of immediately spread to a shortage overall uh, or not necessarily immediately but just the, anyway just that sort of interconnection thank you thank you comrade that's that's a great question to answer it fully would take perhaps more time than we've got but i can give you the cliff notes version uh and the cliff notes version is this that um uh, and I'm sorry, you've, uh, I think you've frozen, at least I hope, I hope you've frozen and that's not me. Uh, am, I, am I still good? Okay, I, I, I can, okay. Um, so uh, the, the, the short version is that if you look at who's throwing away the food, it's um, large scale commodity producers. Uh, and they're throwing away the, the food for a couple of reasons. One, because as you say, their buyers, uh, the institutional buyers uh, and the supply chains that they're knit into are about these, you know, they, they sell to McDonald's, they sell to Walmart. Walmart decides they don't want to buy. Uh, these producers have nowhere else to sell. And that's what monopoly power looks like, right? I mean, the, the, these uh, farmers are usually on the hook for that, right? It's not Walmart that has to pay for them throwing the milk away. Uh, it's it's the, you know, the, the, the structure of a system that concentrates market power in the hands of these, uh, you know, of these financiers and the corporations that they own. Uh, but devolves responsibility and risk to everywhere else in the food system. But the, the architecture of the, of the long supply chain from, you know, industrial milk production facility to, uh, you know, the, the restaurant uh, and end user supply chain that, that's about industrial agriculture, that is broken because it's always been whittled down to be the most efficient that it can be. But not all farmers are facing this, right? If, if you look at the shorter supply chains, you know, right there in the Bay Area, um, you, you, you may, may have heard that farmers that are engaged in CSAs, uh, community supported agriculture initiatives, can't keep up because those short supply chains are really very robust. Um, the problem is that they're expensive. And for, for working people uh, with wages so low, the, you know, the, 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 the options are very few. You can't afford to usually get involved in the, the, the CSA supply chains. So th there's, th there's the, the, the long versus the short supply chain and the, the architecture of that. The, the other factor is about migrant labor. Um, in uh, the, the stories I've seen about uh, people throwing away large amounts of crops involve those crops rotting in the fields for want of not just a buyer, but people to pick them. Uh, and it's been very interesting to see, for example, in Europe, some of the responses. Um, you know, we're, we're living in a, in a, in a moment of uh, heightened uh, xenophobia. Uh, and in Europe, initially, the response was a call to patriotism and nationalism. So uh, the Germans and the French said, hey, furloughed workers, uh, you know, for France or for the homeland, uh, you, you need to get out into the fields and harvest asparagus in the case of Germany or uh, you know, something, perhaps an early harvest, strawberry or something in the, in the case of um, uh, France. Uh, but it was, you know, get into the fields and harvest this stuff for the country. Um, and in the end, uh, urban workers, um, in part because uh, the work of farming has been so psychologically devalued that you know, people can't see themselves doing it, but in part, uh, you know, people were just not ready to, to uh, schlep out into the fields and be paid nothing to do, uh, to, to do, to do this work. Um, in the end, a lot of European countries flew in workers from uh, Eastern Europe, from Romania, for example. In the United States, there wasn't even a call to patriotism. Um, you know, this most racist of administrations merely renewed the visas automatically of the farm workers from uh, Mexico and from, you know, from North America and from Central America to, to come in uh, and to engage in that work. And to, to, uh, but uh, with, with uh, the caveat that one of the things the White House is exploring right now is something called wage relief. And when wage relief is the strange Orwellian term that means that workers can get paid less uh, to do farm work so that farmers don't have to, uh, you know, don't have to pay their workers quite as much. But that's, you know, that, these are the remedies to the broken long supply chains. Um, and it is true that 
while uh, working people are um, in general uh, constrained in terms of what it is that is available for, for a constrained budget. It's also true that people face time constraints and that the food system has been built in order to be able to encourage people to, to eat on the fly and to grab a meal a day at a restaurant. You, know, to, you eat your food on your lap rather than cooking it in community in ways that for everyone, if it was shared and spread out, were, would be cheaper, would be, become neoliberalized our food habits. Um, so it, it, you're, you're right that there is a difference between the diet of the rich and the poor uh, and the, the supply chains of the rich and the poor. But the, you know, the end effect is to point out how frail the, the supply chains are. Um, and it's also, you know, I, I just do want, want to sort of bear in mind that if we think about hunger, and this is a really important uh, idea that, that if, if you take nothing else away from what, what, what I'm saying, take away this, and I will say it slowly so you can. Um, food doesn't cure hunger. Uh, and the reason food doesn't cure hunger is because hunger is a function of poverty. We have more than enough food in the world. Um, and uh, particularly as we move into the 21st century, that may not be true. Uh, if people continue to eat meat, uh, then meat eating is a way of taking grains out of the bowls of poor people and putting it into the bellies of cows and then into the bellies of rich people. But right now we have more than enough food to feed everyone uh, and to feed everyone well. The problem is not just a problem of moving the food around physically. Uh, but it's a problem of poverty. And so if we're thinking about the long fight of poverty, if we're thinking about hunger in the United States, then the hunger comes not from, uh, you know, the milk being sort of poured down the drain or the rutabaga rotting the field. Uh, it is about uh, actual, you know, the poverty that the working class are being thrown into by the capitalists uh, and not being able to afford the food that is right there on the shelves. And again, in the Bay Area, everyone knows that. I mean, the Bay Area has never had a food shortage, and yet the Bay Area has always had hunger. Uh, and uh, you know th those dynamics are what make us want to be socialists and revolutionary socialists in that. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I have a lot of questions, and a lot of it ties in with what you just were talking about. But I'll just divide it into two, to try to make it uh, clear. Um, about what you're saying about poverty and migrant workers, um, I heard, for example, of a a fairly small family farmer, a uh, dairy farmer who said that because her workers always go uh, to Mexico for the winter when it's slow and they can't come back now, that was why she, uh, that's why they couldn't uh, get rid of their milk. And because the cows have to be milked every day, um, they have to milk them, so they have to throw it away. Um, and then that ties into this whole question of what you were saying about the European countries, first calling on sort of this nationalistic thing of, you know, do your own work in the fields. Um, so I guess, uh, is, it, uh, is there any, um, any aspect of what you're talking about that relates to, for example, uh, making field work a decent way, a good wage, uh, an attractive uh, thing to be doing? Is that something that helps in general? And another question I have uh, is, on a political level, is this something, for example, let's say in a utopian uh, dream that we had a US government that really did want to change this, is this something that one country can do by themselves? Is this something that involves um, the, you know, all the money organizations, all the world organizations, including the UN? Uh, where, where would the change have to come if it was really a global systemic change? Thank you, comrade, for that. Uh, uh, what a great question. I mean, I, 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 um, I, I do know that, that, that there are trials uh, in the dairy industry, um, and you know, the, 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 I'll, I'll put in the comments in a second uh, an organisation to, uh, you know, to, to, to support and to learn from in terms of migrant workers in the, in, in the dairy industry. Um, but uh, in terms of wage work, um, yeah, I mean, look, look, we're in the country um, that uh, was made by slavery. Um, and I'm in the state, I'm in Texas, I, and I, I see your Key Boston weird the, uh, mug there, perhaps you are too, um, that, that uh, it, Texas fought for slavery twice. Um, and the, the idea that this country should all of a sudden, uh, of its own will, start recognizing the value of field work is to, to really question what it is that, that are, yeah, I mean, it, it's really to, to, to challenge the idea of America, which I'm very keen to do. Uh, and the, but if we're interested in 
transformative uh, agriculture. We need to recognize the value, not just of the work of picking crops, but the value of agriculture in toto. Uh, and that means uh, shifting towards a kind of agriculture that is not about replacing food workers with capital. I mean, undoubtedly, if, if the capitalists prevail uh, after this crisis, what we'll see is uh, uh, you know, new uh, advances in robotics for almost every bit of, of the food system in which humans might uh, go on strike. Um, and, the, you know, we can imagine, uh, you know, and that there are already kind of uh, robots being developed to do things like pick strawberries and, and, and pick field crops. Um, but there is a country uh, th that I, I quite like that, that has taken on the idea of uh, what it would be like to have transformative food systems in which people uh, connected much more with their food, that it was not just a, a rural thing, but an urban thing to be involved in some sort of agriculture, uh, that where everyone's labor mattered, where everyone was able to eat. Uh, and, and that country is Cuba. Uh, Cuba has a very interesting series of uh, interventions that were driven, importantly, not by the Cuban government, but by the Cuban peasantry. Right. It's important always to remember that, that what, you know, whatever your favorite state is, it only got to that state because of activism. It wasn't that the state uh, you know, and its functionaries in a, in a benign moment decided to, uh, to socialize things. It was driven in Cuba. The story is, is super interesting because after the U.S. applied sanctions uh, and Cuba, you know, after the fall of the, the Warsaw Pact, uh, where Cuba's main role in the West Warsaw Pact was to send rum and sugar to um, the, the Soviet Union and, and, to, and to the rest of the Warsaw Pact. Um, and Cuba was the second largest importer of agricultural chemicals in Latin America. Uh, so it was a very industrial food system. But when the fossil fuels that, required, uh, that are required for that, fuel system, for that food system dried up and Russia stopped sending you know, gas, natural gas and, and fertilizer, um, Cuba went through a, a very traumatic kind of readjustment. The amount of meat that was consumed there went way down. Um, and instead, what you saw was a diversification of farming, a, a system of farming that was called agroecology. It was all about building soil facility rather than buying it in. And uh, it was driven by peasants in the national peasant movement. The, uh, ANAP is the, the, the name of the organization, the acronym for the organization. Uh, and what they did was make the government send out agronomists, agronomists who had for the longest time thought, well, you know, we'll just tell the peasants what to do, they'll do it and we'll, we'll bugger off. But instead the agronomists were made to work in the fields. And so you had this sort of, uh, you know, you had literal organic intellectuals um, who were uh, the peasants and the, you know, the, the folk who had, had book work coming together and developing new systems of agriculture. And through that intersection, you, you started having a valuing of peasant work uh, being spread throughout society. And, and also people were, were starting to grow things themselves and discover new ways of farming themselves. If we're interested in a sort of revolutionary um, transformation of agriculture, we'll need land reform so that many more of us can get involved in that kind of agriculture and recognize the value, not just in picking, but in the intelligence that goes into farming. Because uh, right now, we, you know, capitalism has made farming the sort of thing that any old idiot from the city can be called on to do. I mean, you know, the, the premise of the, the French idea was, and the German idea was, look, I don't care what you did, this is, this is basically idiot work. Uh, and that's, a, you know, to, to restate, in other words, the prejudices about farming. Uh, and what we need to be doing is recognizing, no, farming is incredibly sophisticated. It requires, you know, it requires a lot of knowledge and savvy and work and experience. And yet we treat it as the sort of thing that, that's disposable. And so if we're imagining the sort of, you know, what a revolutionary transformation would be like, then absolutely food needs to get more expensive compared to everything else. Um, you know, obviously after the revolution, you know, the price of food is something that may be just socialized. And again, we have our three meals a day in our social kitchens, which is great. Um, but then, but if we imagine, uh, you know, the intermediate steps of recognizing and valuing work, then actually recognizing the intelligence that goes into land is going to be a vital part of that. And um, it, th this is my way of, of agreeing with you rather long-windedly and, and to say that uh, actual agricultural labor does need to be much more valued. That means food needs to be much more valued. That means, you know, work for everyone needs to be much more valued. Uh, and that's, you know, that work is reproductive labor and productive labor. We need, you know, we, we need income for everyone to be able to afford well-produced food. And cheap food is um, a mistake that, you know, uh, state capitalism uh, um, you know, in, in the Warsaw Pact made just the same as um, regular capitalism uh, here in the United States makes. If uh, Raj can say more about the effects of the freeze of labor that three Indian states have put in place in this past week. <laughs> 
Yeah, the freeze of labor laws, I'm sure you're aware um, that I think Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh put into place in this past week and kind of the effects it might have on agriculture and other types of um, Divya, thank you for the question. I wish I knew more than it has happened. Uh, and you know, the, the data we're seeing, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm looking in, in the Indian press, uh, and of course the Indian press has been shit for years, right? I mean, it's, it's just, uh, people celebrate India and it's, it's many newspapers, um, but increasingly what happens in rural India doesn't matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a few writers um, and uh, a few, you know, sort of engaged intellectuals who write about this. Um, but if you're interested, the People's Archive of Rural India is the place that I go for, for my information, P-A-R-I. Uh, and uh, if, if, you, if, if you Google that, you'll find the latest there. Um, but from what I'm seeing, um, you know, things are already very, very bad. Uh, and I don't imagine that, that these, you know, that, that these restrictions on labor are going to do anything other than be horrific. But this isn't a, an opportunity for me to, to uh, talk about India in, in another way uh, and uh, to celebrate Kerala. Um, because uh, what, what I'm, I'm imagining isn't happening in the states that have Im imposed these, these uh, restrictions is what is happening in Kerala. And I, I suspect Divya, you, 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 you're aware of the, the Kerala response, but I think everyone else needs to hear about it. Um, would you like to talk about that? Uh, no, please go ahead. You're very eloquent. I, I get eloquent a lot, but you know, actually, it's British. Uh, so I, I, you, you should really. Uh, I mean, if, 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 if you if, if you're well informed about it, I, I'd very much like to see the floor to you. Uh, okay. Um, so so um, the, the 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 story in Kerala is that it helps to have a communist government, uh, and uh, in Kerala uh, you have. Uh, millions of meals being made through uh, schools and hospitals uh, and being delivered to the doors of anyone who needs them. You have a, an army of contact tracers um, who are, you know, employed by the state, uh, not only to find out, to, you know, to track down levels of infection, but also to check in on people and make sure that everyone is well. Uh, and you have levels of testing where as, you know, the, the data that I'm seeing, and there's not a whole lot, but it, it already looks like Kerala's way ahead of the rest of the country in terms of um, infections and management of infections and way lower in terms of death uh, because the state has had a fairly robust public health response. Uh, and it was also coming from a place where people were already fairly healthy, where levels of air pollution were bad, but not as bad as elsewhere, particularly in northern industrial states. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I, I use the Kerala example just to remind people that communism works uh, and that actually that there are, um, you know, that there are, it, it, it's night and day from a, a state where uh, workers are treated with respect and where the state is very close to working people, um, as opposed to the kind of oppositional relationship we have here, where the state is obviously run by the executive of the bourgeoisie. But thank you for your question. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do more justice to it. But the participatory, Ar sorry, People's Archive of Rural India is definitely the place to go. Okay, um, my question is, um, are, could you name, or in generally speaking, are you hearing or finding other countries having pro um, the same problems with their uh, food processing and delivering systems to the degree that we are in the US? Uh, th thanks for that question, Dave. Uh, I, I'm, I mean, I, I think that, that different countries are, are doing it differently, uh, for sure. I mean, I, I, I'm not convinced that uh, parts of Eastern Europe uh, are doing terribly well at all. Um, and in terms of the, the food supply uh, and in, in terms of hunger, um, areas that have experienced conflict um, at, already a, 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 coming from a much worse situation than us. Um, I'm hearing uh, from bits of m northern Mexico that, uh, and from, from comrades reporting on things happening there, uh, that uh, the, uh, although local uh, uh, engagement in, in the food system seems to be fairly robust, what, what the US is increasingly applying pressure on Mexico to do, and, and northern Mexico seems to be the frontier of that, is to return to work and open up the economy in ways that local uh, you know, local communities are really not ready to do yet. Um, so th there are ways in which the U.S. Imperium is making things worse for people, um, and northern Mexico is, is a zone of that uh, as, it, as it's been for a while. 
But um, in terms of countries where things are worse than the United States, in the global north, um, you know, I mean, I've got family in Britain and there see, they seem to be able to access food fairly well. Uh, in, in other parts of uh, Eastern Europe, I'm, from, from what I'm reading, it's not, it's not quite as good. Uh, people in, uh, in food importing countries in Asia are, are, are quite worried. What I'm hearing from uh, a comrade in Malaysia, for example, is that they've got about two months of, wheat, of, of rice left. Um, and this is a worry because they remember uh, in the, you know, after the last Great Recession uh, that ex rice exporting countries started to go nationalist and stop exporting food. Uh, and so in terms of access to food, I mean, you know, people can, can get the food and go to the markets and what have you. But uh, soon, if we head back the way that we used to, you know, the, the way that we did a, a few years ago, um, there will be rice shortages in certain parts of the world. But in terms of delivery, in terms of access, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm on thin ice, so perhaps I, I, should, I should stop talking. I have been reading about how the cattle and pork industry actually are hotbeds for animal to human virus transmission. Can you explain how the way we produce meat under capitalism might actually create deadlier viruses that can be transmitted to humans in the future, similar to COVID? Thank you for that fantastic question, Conrad. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the food industry is precisely an engine of, uh, of the, the, the generation of these kinds of viruses. And I grew up in Britain where mad cow was a thing. Uh, mad cow disease uh, you know, really did transform uh, the British relationship to food uh, and to, to food safety. Um, but mad cow disease isn't uh, the worst of it. I mean, you know, H1N1, um, certain kinds of uh, hepatitis, uh, and a, a range of other, you know, I mean, bird flu and swine flu, they, they get these names for a reason. Uh, and they, they, they emanate um, from uh, industrial agricultural production facilities. Um, the, 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 the best single source of this um, is a book called Big Farms Make Big Flu by Rob oh, Wallace. Um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a brilliant book that, that basically says, look, if you want to imagine a, a Petri dish for generating infectious disease, what you would do is get lots of animals that are kind of biologically the same together. And you, you put them really right up next to each other. You would create the most unsanitary conditions you could. But then what you would do is sort of give them low dose antibiotics of the kinds that we, you know, we use every day. Uh, and you just give them that in their food. Uh, and you would create the kinds of breeding ground where um, the minute uh, you, you have repeated sort of aerosolized uh, exposure to food workers, um, and you don't really give those workers much health care. And if you know, workers in, in these industries do start to come down with something, um, you fire them rather than you give them work. And so you encourage them to move away. Uh, and you have a lot of migration. You have a lot of people coming in and out. And maybe you don't keep track of everyone. And that is the perfect cocktail for generating new kinds of disease. Um, and we've, we've had, you know, I mean, in a sense, humans, uh, and particularly in North America, we've, we've been dodging bullets from the food system for so long that it feels like an entitlement. Uh, but the food systems you know, will continue to fire these, these kinds of bullets at us. I mean, you know, as, as best we know, COVID comes from part of the industrial food system that involves uh, different animals coming in much closer contact uh, because their forest area has been uh, contracted than it uh, has been shrunk rather, uh, than ordinarily they would. Um, and there are lots of diseases that seem to have that kind of, uh, of origin story. Uh, you know, uh, HIV is one of them as well, where you know, the, the reason that, that uh, simian immunodeficiency virus uh, jumps to humans is because all of a sudden humans are eating a lot more bushmeat. And why is it humans are eating lots, a lot more bushmeat? It was because of deforestation uh, by uh, loggers in Central Africa. And you, you have these sort of long histories of, uh, of, colonial, uh, you know, of colonialism and of imperialism and capital sort of pushing humans into certain parts of nature where nature is this disposable resource. Uh, and industrial, agricultural, and, and confined animal feeding operations are precisely these kinds of petri dishes uh, of, uh, you know, of uh, incubators of disease. So you're, you're absolutely right to imagine that if, if we carry on with business as usual, um, we should expect many more, uh, many more diseases like this. I love the amount of information that um, Raj is kind of you know, consolidating and intertwining around poverty and food, et cetera. And I always wonder what can one person do um, besides taking all this information and 
you know, spread this information, um, organize. Are there behaviors around this process? Eat locally, vegetarians. I mean, what, from your knowledge base, Raj, do you suggest to individuals around helping this um, transform this, uh, you know, current food crisis? Um, well, th thanks, Nidhi. I mean, uh, in general, I, I think that the individual behavior change is a capitalist trap. Um, I mean, this isn't to say that I don't buy uh, organic, uh, shade-grown, um, fair trade coffee. Um, but that's because the alternative is, you know, exploitative, you know, child labor produced, industrially chemically treated coffee. Um, so, you know, and, you know, other than going for the, the, the fair trade version, I mean, what, what's the alternative? Like bastard coffee, coffee that's particularly bitter uh, because it has the, the blood and tears of children in it. No, you, 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 you do the right thing insofar as you can. Um, but never as a substitute for, for the virtues of organizing. I mean, the, yes, you know, eating less meat, yes, um, buying locally and sustainably uh, and tipping well and all this stuff is important. Um, but these, uh, you know, th that's not how revolution happens. That's not how deep change can ever happen. There's no habit that we can inculcate in ourselves um, that will bring about revolutionary transformation uh, other than the habit of attending meetings and organizing with the working class. Um, and, and I think that that's, you know, it, that, that's the, the worry about any kind of advice that uh, you, you know, the, 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 that answers the question, well, I'm just one person, what can I do? Uh, because when you ask the question, I'm just one person, what can I do? You've given up, in a sense, the power uh, that comes from collective organizing and revolutionary uh, imagination that comes only through working it with communities uh, and working on the ground to be able to make deep change. So, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm, I, do I eat meat? No, I mean, I, I, I will, uh, actually, I am not a pure vegetarian because when I do field work and people slaughter something and give it to me, I am a good guest uh, and I will eat it, um, though my heart wishes I weren't uh, doing that. But uh, in general, you know, moving away from the exploitation of animals, weaving oneself deeper into the web of life um, and engaging in uh, the kinds of engagement in the food system as far as you are able, uh, that supports um, workers, that, that supports workers' organizations, that uh, is good to the soil. All of these individual acts are important. But if you go to the Food Chain Workers Alliance, and I'll stick that in the, in the, in the chat in a second, um, they've got ideas about how it is that you might crack open this individual response to something that's slightly more collective. Uh, and then, you know, ultimately, we need to be building, you know, working class power because it's not enough uh, merely to, uh, you know, to tip well. Uh, that's not going to get us out of a, a society that's built on slavery and tipping. Your question is, Laura asked earlier about what the food production and, and supply chain would look like if it were transformed by a revolution that took capitalism out of the picture. Raj said that there are a lot of good ideas among workers, such as those who work in meatpacking plants. Without asking for a whole programmic Overview: Can Raj outline some of these ideas as characteristic examples? Thank you. Um, I, I, I I've got now starting to have a uh, long list of uh, things I need to stick in the the, the chat. Um, but the uh, example that I'm going to uh, stick in is from the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, um, who in uh, managed to get land uh, in and around Minneapolis uh, and where. Uh, slaughterhouse workers um, are now farmers and also owners of a warehouse and uh, are owners of a retail facility. Um, what that looks like is that then you've got union farm to, you know, farm to uh, check out at least uh, provisions of, uh, you know, where workers own the means of production. Um, and that kind of, uh, you know, is a very specific kind of example, but it's a way in which both we get, uh, we hint at some, one of the big transformations that need to happen, which is around land reform. Um, we get to one of the other big transitions that needs to happen is around supply chain bottlenecks. I mean, the, the reason um, to get back to an earlier comrade's question about the, why milk and other things are being thrown away is because 
we have these uh, very tight supply chains and very few distribution centers. But with a, a worker owned distribution center that is um, able to provide food uh, and aggregate food from smaller producers and provide them to institutional buyers like schools and hospitals and what have you and you know, other government facilities, uh, you break some of these supply chains open. Um, and then you, know, you have retail that's not driven by uh, the kind of rapacity that uh, our, you know, the, the Walmart is, but the, you, you have retail uh, availability where people who work in retail get paid a decent wage uh, and the, the, a fair price is being charged at the end of it. So th this is a very specific example, but it's one that if we take you know, land reform, and breaking the supply chain open and treating workers who are, you know, at the moment, the essential disposable workers as dignified members who are able to own the means of production, um, you can stitch these ideas together. And because, you know, and what I love about it is that these ideas are coming from UFCW, which is, you know, a union that in some, in, you know, that is in some places actually helping to save lives through, uh, you know, through insisting on PPE for, for uh, slaughterhouse workers, but in the long term says, actually uh, you know, the meat industry is not sustainable it's it's carbon hoof print is too big uh, and it's uh, you know the, the the damage that it's causing the planet is unsustainable we need to move out we need to have a just transition away from meat packing and we need to look you know, look much more like a worker-owned uh, land reform uh, supply chain reform and, and, and sort of uh, working proletariat reform uh, vision and that that seemed fairly revolutionary to me Hello, um, I don't really have a question. Uh, I just want to make a, a comment about what was, uh, I don't remember who, who brought it up, but uh, Raj was talking about how do we deem farming um, a, a good job, a livable, good wage job, uh, and that goes for not just farming, but just any job within the food industry that is not the head chef. Um, and I think we need to be very explicit and direct about talking on white supremacy and how it's really the root of the capitalism that we have today, because we have seen that uh, when white folks take over institutions or systems, uh, we know who's going to suffer and who's going to get the least benefits. Um, and, you know, that an example could be farming and how black farmers have been denied uh, subsidies and loans. Um, and now we don't have, we only have black farmers in the single digits in the United States. Um, and even within the restaurant, you know, we can see a lot of that racism that goes into play where the hostess will be a white woman or a white man uh, or a light skinned black person or a white passing Latinx person. And then the dishwasher is going to be a, a brown person who's not gonna be seen, shown to, to the general population. And I think this conversation just needs to be very explicit about the reason why we have the injustices that we have is because of that rooted racism that this country was founded on. Um, and, and Raj did talk about this. So that was just the comment I wanted to make. Um, and I appreciate folks having this conversation as much needed, not just for the United States, but globally. Thank you. I, I, I'm a, th thank you. Uh, I mean, yes. White supremacy is a problem. I think, uh, you, I mean, and I, I'm, and while you're at it, I mean, again, you, you've talked about patriarchy too. Um, and again, you know, after, the, I mean, if we're, we're thinking about what, what that food system looks like after, um, after the revolution, then it is one that will address simultaneously uh, how it is that, you know, that, that this, this land is uh, made through capitalist patriarchal white supremacy. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was just, I was just thinking about this, the, the question of farms of color, and of course, you know, the, the fact that we're all, I mean, it, you've got a beautiful picture there of, of old lonely land, um, and uh, the fact that it's, uh, you know, that we are on uh, uh, stolen land, and I, just apropos of nothing, but something just makes me fucking angry right now is um, the, the federal response for uh, COVID for 
First Nations um, is uh, so far there's been five million dollars worth of federal uh, support to um, indigenous, uh, you know, to, to Native American communities, um, and that's it. Uh, and you know, pe people are dying in droves. And I was just reading about uh, the, the 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 crimes uh, in in South Dakota. The governor saying that uh, w one of the nations there has 48 hours to remove a roadblock that checks for COVID, so that COVID can you know that people can move freely through. Uh, I believe Navajo communities, and it's just, uh, yeah. So the, 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 this country is filled um, and continues to perpetuate the sins uh, on which it was founded. Um, and you know, any any revolution worth a damn is going to take all of those on at the same time. So thank you so much, Alma. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, this question is for probably an old version of me, but. Um, I was thinking about those that like to work in local farms and um, work in like CSA farming locally. And so I was just wondering what you think, how much do you think is, is what is considered, well, I think what's important is the best use of our time is the question and what to do with it. And so if I think about like where we think of like where we waste our time, do you think it's a waste of time to be working in local farms when we're racing against a climate catastrophe and when climate will change so much that the crops that we're even growing um, won't be able to sustain the climate? Um, so I was just wondering what you think about that. Uh, thank you, Comrade. I mean, I, I think that there's the, the um, the, the many people who want to work on farms, even many young people who, who are really keen to get their hands in the dirt are uh, not misguided. Um, I, I think it's, it's really important for us all to, to get reconnected to the earth um, and to learn how to grow things, not for any survivalist reason, um, but because, again, if, if we're thinking about a good revolution, then it's not the revolution in which uh, that involves a certain kind of human supremacy uh, over the web of life, um, because we're living the, the, the sort of consequences of that now, where we imagine that humans can do whatever we want to the rest of the web of life and get away with it. Um, and so I, I certainly think that insofar as we, as we reconnect uh, in a way that's not sort of bourgeois, but is actually, uh, you know, in some ways a revolutionary peasant uh, with different ways of farming and uh, of, you know, agroecological relationships between beings and the web of life, that is entirely compatible with uh, you know, the, the kinds of transformations we need to meet the climate crisis and the crisis of capitalism. But it's, you know, I think what's interesting is the mode with which we farm. Uh, you know, it's, it's entirely possible to have the kind of farming that depends on routine applications of glyphosate, uh, of Roundup, of pesticides that uh, destroy the soil and contaminate us all. Um, in the same way that it's possible to have kinds of farming that are about liberation, that are about um, mutual aid, that are about solidarity, that are about uh, confronting and transforming relationships of power. And again, you know, I, I like La Via Campesina's model of food sovereignty, because um, the, the idea of food sovereignty is that there should be community-driven uh, approaches to addressing the needs of hunger. Uh, and essentially food sovereignty is a process through which people get together and deliberate how it is that we're going to feed ourselves and, uh, and our community. Uh, and the first thing that comes out of this process of deliberation after saying, well, you know, we, don't, we should defund the World Bank and stop the World Trade Organization, the first big idea that comes out is about um, gender equality. Uh, and I think that's interesting because if we're thinking about uh, farmers, you know, peasants getting together and discussing things, um, it's, it's only prejudice that prevents us from believing that the first thing on, on everyone's mind is equality. But actually, farmers working together uh, through a very politicized process of organizing and farming um, came up with the idea that actually, if we are to have meaningful equality and justice, then what we need to do is have gender equality. And that justice moves from the home all the way out to society at large. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, the, the, the the, the way to answer your question, comrade, and to, to speak to your former self, uh, is to say, look, there's nothing bad about farming inherently. In fact, there, there are lots of good things about it if, if it's done in a way that, that's about building working class and peasant power. Uh, and that can also be an enriching and healthful relationship with the rest of the web of life. 
And it's only capitalism that, that soured that. Um, and you know, there are ways in which we can, you know, we can uh, reinvent certain parts of, you know, some cultures' engagements with the web of life, but also throw away all the crap that feudalism uh, had in terms of, of peasant relationships and reimagine what that might look like for, for a revolutionary future. Uh, so first, uh, I just want to thank Raj for his presentation. It was really, uh, really thought provoking. Um, so I have, so the first part is I want to make an observation and then I had a more direct question. So um, my perspective might be a little unique. Uh, I grew up in rural Alabama on a family farm, actually. Um, and then I moved to Los Angeles. So it's a very different, uh, a very different uh, experience to extremes there. Um, so you said earlier about uh, this dynamic of not valuing uh, farm labor. Um, to me, it feels much more of like a, a rural urban dichotomy than more of a, than more of a general devaluing of farm labor. Uh, growing up in a rural community, you know, everyone's family is involved, involved in farming in some capacity. And, um, what I always thought was interesting about Alabama is part of the state curriculum is from ninth to 12th grade, we were taking agriculture classes. So everyone was engaged with agriculture in some capacity there. Um, but out here in California, you know, it really feels like, especially in the cities, people's engagement with agriculture really stops at the grocery store, right? You, you go to the grocery store, the food's on the shelf, but people never really engage with where their food comes from. Um, so it feels to me like agriculture is devalued in the urban centers here in California, but if you go to rural areas, uh, it's much more valued. And I think that's, uh, there's like a, there's a, rural urban split there. Um, and then there, as a direct question, um, my family is from Ukraine originally, uh, and they went through collectivization back in the 20s and 30s. And I was really curious, you know, we were talking earlier about the decommodification of food. And uh, I wonder how, you know, how we get to that point where we have food access, you know, for everybody, but we avoid some of the failings of the past, like Soviet collectivization, uh, where, you know, there's this really heavy um, you know, government hand coming in and regardless of what farmers needed, you know, the government was sort of dictating them and there were, you know, lots of disasters uh, related to that whole process. Now, I wonder if you could maybe talk about how we avoid some of those problems uh, in the past with that kind of approach. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Luke, for uh, both your, your points. I, I mean, I, I absolutely take your point that there's a rural, rural urban split. Uh, and even here in the South, um, in, in Texas, there's, there's definitely that kind of uh, rural urban split. Though, again, I mean, one of the interesting uh, things about the Bay Area is also that, that there's, you know, that there is more of a food and foodie conversation that's, uh, that, that may be, you know, that, 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 that is promising. And I'm, I'm doing some work um, with uh, some permaculture folk there around, around some of that. I'll, I'll, that that's for another, another time. Um, but if, we, if we're thinking about land reform, um, I mean, land reform has a, has a bad rap uh, because people will say things like, oh, yeah, well, I mean, obviously the, the, the sort of heavy handed Soviet collectivization was a disaster. But there's some really interesting stuff coming up about um, collectives in China um, where, uh, you know, the, 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 the current premier uh, was, was raised and where it's increasingly clear that actually the only reason China is able to be the China, you know, the, the, the place that, that we recognize now is because um, these collectives were incredibly successful, uh, but the collectives themselves didn't get any money. Uh, the, the money was taken by the state and was spent on industrialization in the cities and then siphoned off by the bankers. Uh, but the, it's, you know, there's, uh, and I'll, I, I will again add to the references, uh, a book by one of my comrades, Joshua Eisenman, um, on, uh, and I think it's called uh, Red China's Green Revolution. Um, but uh, it, it's a story about how uh, collectives you know, were incredibly efficient and important in terms of the, um, you know, the, the, the operation of the, the Chinese economy. But then if you're thinking about um, land reform, more recently people say, well, you know, land reform is obviously a bad idea, look at Zimbabwe. Uh, and let's look at Zimbabwe. And in fact, all the data show that despite a botched, uh, you know, and really quite sort of shitty government approach to, to collective, uh, of, of land reform, where um, the government seized farms, gave them to sort of politically connected people and then some peasants. Uh, the fact was that if you were landless before the land reform, you were way better off afterwards. And even if the gov government gave you no response and no support and nothing other than you know, the title deed and you know, the keys to the door, 
Um, in general, working people did much better uh, in Zimbabwe after land reform than they did before. Um, so if, if we're thinking about well, what does revolutionary transformation look like, um, Zimbabwe is really interesting because the, the farms and the processes, you know, the, the, the organizations that did the best in Zimbabwe were not the individual family farms, but precisely the collective ones. Uh, the ones where people not only took over, you know, got land given to them by the government, but then decided to pool their resources and work together. And uh, I think it's, it's really interesting to re revisit um, one's ideas about whether land reform can be successful or not. Um, in, you know, and if Zimbabwe is as bad as it gets, then actually that's pretty good because compared to what happened before, uh, you know, the, the land reform has been successful there and uh, it wasn't government driven. Uh, sorry, the, the collectivization wasn't a government driven. The collectivization was, was taken on by the initiative of, of, a few, of a few people. One can imagine that that could have been much more successful if the government had provided the resources and the training and the initiative and the, the vision and the leadership uh, for uh, cooperatives to form. And I do think that cooperatives, rather than uh, you know, the sort of heavy-handed Soviet, uh, is probably the way to go. Um, and the, the kinds of collectives that I, I like the look of are the ones that are in uh, the, you know, the, the, that are in the, the sort of purview of United Food and Commercial Workers or the MST in Brazil. Um, that does the sort of medium to large scale investigation of agroecology and, and permaculture. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there, there are models, look to the MST, look to Zimbabwe, um, and uh, again, you know, it, closer to home, um, so some of the, the sort of collectives that aren't just about the land, you know, of, of sort of being forced to work on the land by the state, uh, but rather a, a much more sort of anarchist driven model um, that decentralizes power in ways that are. Uh, for that reason, I think much more healthy in terms of providing a, a robust ecosystem of people being able to uh, manage uh, and, and engage in acts of mutual solidarity. You mentioned the First Nations, and I've also been really disturbed about what's going on there. And I'm curious whether um, it sounds to me like the government is basically saying, you're not part of our country, you have your own government, so therefore we have no response really for you at all. And, and then I also, that also kind of ties in with this idea of uh, what you were saying about quality of food. So uh, one question is prescriptively, I, don't, I haven't really quite known what to, how to help. So I'm just curious, what do you think is the best way to assist them right now? And another question is uh, when you start talking about quality of food and then it reminds me of First Nations, then you start talking also about um, some of the problems, health problems our food creates, which is also exacerbating the problem in poor communities because of the way they eat more than, that's one of the, one of the racial disparities we're having, huh? That's a result of how people are eating. And whether um, uh, there's very little information put out by uh, scientists in the food industry about the, how much these foods poison us and how much they weaken our systems. And um, so I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about those things. I do, super quickly, because um, I, I am going to have to leave fairly soon because I, I need to engage in uh, anti-patriarchal reproductive labor and look after some kids who are, uh, you, you may have heard screaming in the background. Um, but uh, th th there are all, all kinds of offensive things going on, uh, particularly administered by the, the government. I, I just put a link to land grabs that, 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 that the US government have been involved in. Uh, there are solidarity campaigns associated um, with uh, some of some of this, um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll be able to provide the links probably tomorrow now um, around some of those things. In terms of food and health, uh, I'm writing a book on that, um, so watch this space. Uh, but, but there's basically, yeah, I mean, the, the, the way in which working class communities have been given um, kinds of foods that predispose them to uh, actually developing the worst symptoms of, of uh, the, this particular epidemic. Um, it's it's a crime, and we need to fight it. Uh, but more on that soon. So Raj, I want to thank you very much for this. I'm not even going to ask my question because I know you have very important things to attend to and we'll see you again. And uh, I did have some questions. Maybe I'll email you later. Thanks. Thank you, Conrad. Raj, maybe I should do the same thing. If I hear the choo-choo train in the, in the background. It's more screaming, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I really appreciate your call for us to organize together for social revolution rather than to focus just on our individual actions. Of course, we do the best we can individually to support people who are producing food in a less repulsive 
dangerous manner, but if we depend on that, it's, it's just not gonna get us anywhere. So thank you very much.